It was in 1950 that Pope Pius XII declared that the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that in conformity with present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussions on the part of men experienced in both fields take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter for the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that the souls are immediately created by God. Basically what Pius was saying was that it is okay for people in the church to teach and embrace evolution as long as uh, they understand that the soul was created by God, not necessarily the body or the material things of this world, but the soul which must be uh, recognized as created by God. His successor, Pope John Paul II, said that my predecessor, Pius XII, had already stated that there was no opposition between evolution and the doctrine of faith about man and his vocation on condition that one did not lose sight of several indisputable points, theories of evolution, which uh, in accordance with the philosophies inspiring them consider the mind as emerging from forces of living matter or as a mere epiphenomenon of this matter are incompatible with the truth about man. Basically, all Paul, John Paul was saying was that there is there's no opposition between evolution and the doctrine of faith as long as we recognize that the soul is created by God. If we say that the mind or the soul comes from the epiphenomenon or the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the idea of a heightened phenomenon beyond uh, what we normally see in, in the natural, uh, naturalistic part of the world. And so he said we can't, we can't accept those things. In 2006, the Episcopalian General Con uh, Convention adopted the resolution which reads in part, that the theory of evolution provides a fruitful and unifying scientific explanation for the emergence of life on earth, that many theological interpretations of origin can readily embrace an evolutionary outlook, and that an acceptance of evolution is entirely compatible with authentic living Christian faith. In 2002, the Presbyterian General Assembly affirmed there is no contradiction between an evolutionary theory of human origins and the doctrine of God as creator. Why are so many denominations abandoning the teaching of Scripture for the consequences or the, the, the uh, consensus of science? When did science stop being about the pursuit of knowledge and, and instead the pursuit of consensus? Another good question. Tonight's our second Sunday of the month, and therefore we're going to look at apologetics. Is there ample proof that the Bible is wrong, we might ask? Or is there something else working in these concessions? And all of these play into a, a question that is asked time and time and time again. And that is, how old is the earth? How old is the planet that we live upon? Within biblical scholarship, even, I would say, conservative scholars who believe in the inspiration of the Bible, who believe in the miraculous powers of God and of Jesus, who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for our sins so that we might have redemption, there is still a growing and acceptable trend to look at the earth as old, ancient, often referred simply to or simply as uh, old earth creationism. They would say that the creation story of Genesis chapter 1 is myth, or in fact they would say anything from creation all the way to the Tower of Babel is myth. In fact, uh, among biblical scholars, or those who are referred to as biblical scholars anyway, uh, I would say the vast majority of them consider Genesis 1 through 11 as something that's mythologized. And so therefore they don't have any qualms about saying that the earth is old or that uh, God used evolution uh, to bring about what we see today in our modern world. There are those who have embraced the idea of God and creation and evolution. Uh, how does that fit into uh, uh, the, 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 the scheme that we see today? There's one theory simply referred to as the day-age theory, 
We'll take the day, the six days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. We will lengthen them as needed. Uh, some early in this particular uh, uh, theory, I would say, you know, the, the Bible says, for example, in 2 Peter 3, that a thousand years is as a day to God, and, and a day is a thousand years. And therefore, if a day in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 1 could be a thousand years. However, we have to understand that uh, 2 Peter 3 is, is, a, is, is figurative language. It's not saying that a day is literally 1,000 years to God because he gives the opposite of it as well. 1,000 years is as a day. What Peter is pointing out is that uh, time doesn't have a lot of meaning to God. Uh, God knows all things. And it certainly isn't a formula for how to interpret or understand the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. So most who believe in the day-age theory today do not try to find some formula in the Old or New Testament to say a day equals this length of time. In fact, what most people who believe in the day-age theory now uh, believe that the days themselves are not equal lengths, that the first age or day, uh, because the word yom, they say, can mean an age or an expanse of time, that first age uh, would take us up to a certain point in the geologic table or the evolutionary cycle uh, when there is some sort of an explosion or, or some uh, form of, uh, you know, what was not there before is suddenly there, as they would say. And by suddenly, they mean in a span of about a million years. That's suddenly in, 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 in uh, uh, evolutionary terms. Uh, and then, you know, that begins the second day or second age until that, that remains pretty much the same for a while. And then all of a sudden, there's an explosion or there's a, a jump in the evolutionary cycle. And that starts day three. And, you know, that first one might be, you know, 200 million years, and that second age may only be 30 million years, and the next age might be, you know, 900 million years. And so the, the, the days themselves uh, are lengthened uh, to account for what they see in, a, in the geologic table. This is akin to, not necessarily the same thing as the, the old progressive creationism, that God, that allows God to create, and then uh, uh, as things are evolving, uh, they need a little help, and so God steps in and gives them a little shove, and things explode, and they, they go, they rock on for a little while about the same, then God steps in, and he, and he gives it another little creative shove, and that's the, the concept of, of progressive evolution that allows God to create, then allows creation to take over with God simply helping it along now and then. Now, much of this comes from the oft-repeated and generally accepted evolutionary theory that requires an ancient earth to accomplish the modern phenomena of variegated life that we see today. Things are not the same. Uh, life is different. A cow is not a dog. A dog is not a, a pig, and a pig is not a boy, right? We understand that, that, that life is different at different levels and different stages, uh, some animals grow and age more quickly and reach old age, if we can use that in animal terms, and die maybe after 10 to 15 years, and others may live to be 100 years old. Other animal species can live to be over 100 years old. So we understand that, that animals and life, plant life and you know, human life, it's, it's all different, but it, it's made up of the same ideas. And so evolutionary theory comes in and says, in order to get... What we see today, we had to have a large expanse of time. You know, if everything began with a single organism that existed, or I don't know how long, and no one does, but then for that organism to somehow replicate cellular mitosis or meiosis, I guess that would be mitosis, and for that to become a multi-celled organism, evolve into uh, an organism that, that has different systems within it instead of just within the cells. And then for that to happen close enough in proximity and time uh, to produce another one that can mate with the first one to produce the next one. The, the, the chances are so astronomical that we needed more than a, a couple of thousand years. That was Darwin's contention all along. Uh, his theory required time, and so he expanded the general consensus about the age of the earth 
up into the hundreds of thousands of years. He was a posh neophyte back then, wasn't he? Uh, today, most scientists place the age of the earth around 4.5 to 13.5 billion years of age. So let's consider tonight what the Bible says about the age of the earth. What science adds to the discussion. I think sometimes as Christians we, we, uh, uh, we, 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 we lash out at science and we don't want to hear what it has to say because uh, you know, this is what the Bible says. And I, you know, I know we're all smart enough not to do that, but you know, there is a, a, a large contingent of people who wear the name of Christ who blind, willingly blind their eyes to science, and we certainly don't want to do that. So we, we want to be open to what does the scientific data say as well. But let's begin with what the Bible actually says. Uh, the Bible says that God created the earth, the heavens and the earth, uh, in the beginning, right? Genesis 1 and verse 1. The rest of Genesis 1 then tells us that God went through these six days of creation and what he created in those days. And then on the seventh day, he rested. And so you have the creation week, as we often refer to it. But really, it's, it's about six days. God created all things in six days. Now, the, this word yom in the Hebrew uh, that, that we often talk about becomes a point of contention. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, it means day, but a few times in the Bible, it's like back in my day, uh, and we don't mean back in a specific day in my life, we mean back in a certain period of time in my life. Back in my day, they did it this way. Uh, and there's a few places in the Old Testament that actually use the, the word day or yom in that, that sense. The vast majority of time, though, it's in reference to either the daylight hours basically 12 hours, or to the 24-hour day, morning and evening. Now, if Moses was wanting us to understand that this was a, a literal 24-hour day, you know, what word would he have used? He would have used this word. But Moses didn't leave it up to chance, did he? He, he added in, in this, and the morning and the evening, which we use to count days, by the way, Moses used them to say in the morning and the evening was the first day. And the morning and the evening was the second day. And the morning and the evening was the third day. Not only that, but this Hebrew word, yom, day, when it's modified by a numeric order, like first or second or third or fourth, the ordinals, it's always, 100% of the time, a 24-hour day. Now, I will say that those who are old earth creationists will come in and, and point out, but there's not much use of the ordinal with the word day in the rest of the Old Testament. Therefore, it's kind of a, a, a spurious argument, they would say, that, uh, that, that yom with a number ne means a 24-hour day. Uh, because the Bible simply doesn't use that phrase any other time in the Bible. But if I'm Moses, and I want people to get it and get it clearly, I'm going to tell him, day, first day, morning, evening. He does everything he can do to show that this is a day and not simply an expanse of years. And then later, throughout the rest of the Bible, but beginning in Exodus 20 and verse 11, says in six days God created all that is in it. And so the idea of the creation story is six days. So that's, that's the beginning. We're going to count the age of the earth uh, we begin with six days. Now, that's, that's not a lot when you start talking about years. You know, when we start talking about years, you don't say, give or take a couple of days. We usually say, give or take a couple of years. But you, we have to tack that on there as well. Uh, then, you know, if we're going to count, let's count from creation to one of the major events in Genesis chapter 12, uh, uh, chapter 6, I'm sorry, which is the flood. And uh, uh, we have the, the genealogy in chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5, and uh, it adds, you know, that, that Adam was, was such and such age when he had Seth, and Seth was such and such age when he had uh, his son, uh, Enos, and uh, Adam, Seth, Cainan, I'm sorry, I have to go, you know, back in preaching school, we had to memorize that lineage, and part, bits and pieces of it are still there, kind of like the uh, evolutionary chain. Uh, it's probably missing more than I have retained, however, but uh, uh, so Adam, Seth, and Cainan, 
uh, you know, these, these are the lineage of Christ. And that, keep that in mind. These aren't just the firstborn of those people. These are the, the lineage of Christ. Who was the firstborn of Adam? Cain, right? So I'm, I'm sorry, this is not a Bible class, Dale. <laughs> I need not do that. I don't want, don't want to fool you on that one. <laughs> so I know, I know. So, uh, uh, you know, Seth was his third child. But Seth is the, the one through who the lineage of Christ is going to come. And so that becomes the focal point of these genealogical tables. But what it does do is it tells us that if, if we add this person's age when this person was born and add his age uh, to whenever his child was born and add his age and so forth, we get approximately uh, 1,656 years, give or take a year or two. And the reason why that is, is the case, we have to give or take a year or two, is because not very many of them had the son of the lineage of Christ on their birthdays. You know, that you would have to have it on their birthday. So obviously you can give or take, you know, several, several months. And if you add up, you know, two or three or five months to every age, uh, then that, that 1656, you know, give or take a few years is what we would say. And so we're counting ages at their birth. Uh, and then, you know, if we went from the flood to say the birth of Abraham, uh, then we have in Genesis chapter 11, another genealogical table, again, telling us the age of people when, when their children are born and so forth like that. Uh, and it is uh, approximately uh, 400 to 5,000 years. And you say, that's a big jump, Sam. Why such a big jump? Well, because the phraseology used in chapter 11 is different from the ch phraseology of chapter 5. What's used in chapter uh, 11 uh, is the, the precise ages are very difficult to pin down with certainty. For example, uh, Genesis eleven twenty six says, When Terah was, had lived 70 years, he fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now, who was the oldest of his children? Was it Abram, Nahor, or Haran? Well, generally speaking, the first one mentioned is, is usually the oldest. But in this case, we know that that's not true. Because Terah was 70 when he had his first child. But if we go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 4, it says that, that when he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran, and after his father died, talking about Abram, after Abram's father died, Terah, God removed him from there into the land in which he is now living. So uh, uh, when, when Moses left Haran, Terah died. We know that Terah was 205 years old when he died, uh, according to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 11. And it says in, in, uh, uh, that, that when Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and went with him, Abram was 75 years years old when he departed from Haran. So Terah is 205 the year he dies. Abraham, Abram leaves uh, in that year to go into the, the promised land, and he is 75. And so if you take 205 and subtract 75 from it, Terah was 130 years old when Abram was born, which means that if he was 70 years old, at his first child, either Haran or Nahor, and then it's 60 years later, they have Abraham. You wonder if that was a planned one or not after 60 years, but that's what happened. So when we start adding up the ages in, in chapter 11, we have to understand that the, the child that is listed first is, is the one through whom the lineage comes, which, by the way, that's why Abram was first. But the age given is whenever he became a father, which may not be with that child. It may be with one of the other children. So if you take all the generations that are listed there, and with Moses, I mean with Abram, there's a 60-year gap between them. You can see very quickly how 400 might stretch to as many as 5,000. So we just, we, we can't give a precision uh, because we don't have that background that we have on Abram in Acts and, and Acts 11 and Genesis chapter 12. and all. We don't have that on all of the generations. 
But we do have that on Abraham, which suggests that it could be. I'm not saying that, that all of them happened that way. If we just took them at face value, we'd come up with about 400 years. But it could be more. So we'll, we'll, we'll take the outside uh, just, just to be conservative here uh, on, on those chances. Uh, by the way, uh, Seth and Shem, Arphaxad, Jacob, Judah, none of these were the firstborn, but all of them were in the lineage of Christ. And so uh, that's not unusual. We mentioned it for Adam and Seth and Terah and Abraham, but they are not certainly not the only ones. Uh, and so we have from the birth, uh, from the flood to the birth of Abraham. Now, uh, let's take a big leap from Abraham to Christ. We could throw a lot of different things in here, uh, you know, to, to help uh, give us the age and so forth. Uh, but it's about 2,000 years. Is that the exact number? Well, you know, there's a lot of things uh, that, that come into play here. Uh, we start using calendars of other nations like the nation of Egypt who counted days differently than the Jews counted days. The Jews who, by the way, counted the calendar differently than what we count the calendar. They generally used a 360-day calendar. And then they had it a pregnant year every 7 to 11 years. That's what they referred to. They called it the pregnant year. What that meant was after so much time, they had to go back and insert an entire month to make everything work out again. We, we don't do that. We just add a quarter day every year. And so every fourth year, we insert a day in leap year. Uh, because it's very difficult, if not, in, well, it is. It's impossible, really, to do a calendar that is perfect. Because the earth does not rotate around the sun on an exact number of days. There's always a fraction of day left over. How do you deal with that? The Egyptians dealt with it one way. The Jews dealt with it another way. In our modern day, we, we deal with it another way. So which calendar are we counting from when we start counting birth years, when we start counting events in the Old Testament and leading up to Christ? Uh, some of those are difficult. Uh, for example, uh, just talking about the Exodus. By the way, there is uh, a, a, a pretty good documentary that is available for rent on Amazon Prime uh, called Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. Uh, if you've not seen that, I'd recommend catching that one. It's a pretty good show. Uh, but what it shows is that our, generally speaking, uh, Egyptologists, uh, people who study ancient Israel, archaeologists and the digs in Egypt and so forth, what they have determined is that at the time that Moses left Egypt, or supposedly left Egypt, there were no Israelites in Egypt. And when they came into the promised land, there were no uh, Israelites in the promised land. So therefore, the Bible account of the Exodus is completely wrong. It's just wrong. All of this hinges upon uh, Moses using the two cities in uh, uh, in reference, or in Egypt, Python and Ramses, that you know they weren't cities until such and such date. So therefore, if Moses is referring to those day, those cities, then then it must be that that these things are happening during that time. And the fact is, is that's uh, that's used as a, pro, a prolepsis many times in the New Testament, uh, or in the Old Testament, even the New Testament. We we could use it here. Uh, you know, Sam might know this, but I'll ask Ivan. Ivan, what was on this spot where this church building was uh, 3,000 years ago? A rock. A rock, okay. Uh, so we might say, you know, in Brighton, Colorado, 3,000 years ago, there was a rock. It's probably true. But you know what wasn't here 3,000 years ago on this spot? Brighton, Colorado. But by telling you at Brighton, Colorado, I'm giving you a modern, contemporary uh, a measurement of where I'm speaking of, even though it did not exist in the time I'm speaking of. And that happens in several places. Uh, you know, like the, the, the city of Dan, for example. Uh, you know, they go to the city of Dan, and then later, years later, something's happening, and they rename the city to Dan. Well, which means that up until that point, it wasn't really called Dan. 
It had a different name, right? The city of Laish, by the way. But it refers to it as Dan before it's called Dan. Why? Because he's writing to people that know it as Dan. And so by calling it Dan, people say, oh, I know where that is. That's up north, right? Yeah, that's Dan. But at the time that Moses is writing about it, it was called Laish. So that's a prolepsis. If Moses is using that same technique and we backed up the timeline just a little bit, do you know what's all over Egypt during that part of the, the, the calendar? Some maybe 1,200 years prior? Israelites in Egypt, all over the place, in slaves, in mass graves, some of them. There's even a, a, a compound that has 12 graves. And one of them is this big mausoleum with a statue of an Israelite wearing Egyptian clothing showing himself to be, I don't know, somewhat of a ruler in Egypt. And 11 other graves. What, what could that be? It could be Joseph. And his 11 brothers, exactly. You know, so anyway, that, that comes out in that documentary. But you know, if, the, the whole, whole point being is that you know, adjusting for calendars and things like that, it's difficult to pinpoint it was exactly 2,000 years. I'm not telling you that from Abraham to Christ was 2,000 and not 2,001 or 2,010. I'm saying it was approximately right in there at that, that 2,000 point. Just like I'll say in this next one, from Christ to the present is about 2,000 years. I know we're in the year 2022, but then there's confusion about what year was Jesus born. Was it the year 6? Was it the year 4 B.C.? Uh, was it the year 1 A.D.? You know, after, after all, we call it A.D., uh, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Uh, so was, it, was that it? Well, we, we've pretty much eliminated 1 A.D. Uh, from the, the year of Jesus' birth. We either push it back to 4 B.C., or possibly even 6 B.C., uh, mainly because in 4 B.C., Herod the Great dies. We know that based upon the Roman calendars and the, the Jewish calendars lining up. And Herod, remember, had the children killed in his kingdom that were, what, two years old and down. Why? Because when the, when the wise men came, they said, he said, when did, when did you see the star? Well, we began seeing it about two years ago. And it's finally brought us to here. So if in the year four he dies, then we have to back it up a little bit more, possibly as far as six. So again, these dates are not perfect. Don't go out of here and saying, Sam said that the earth is exactly you know, 9,876 years old. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we can get a general framework from what the Bible actually says about these things. So if we were to add these up, the 15, uh, 56, the 5,000 on the outside range of that 400 to 5,000, 2,000 and 2,000, we'd get about 10,000, 56 years and six days. We'll just add the six days on at the end there. Uh, so uh, that's basically where we get. So Jesus uh, 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 himself, he refers to this same period of creation uh, that Genesis chapters 1 through 11, Jesus certainly believed that it was real and not imagined with real people and real events. Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, Jesus says, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He doesn't mean on the sixth day of great epochs of time. He means in the, in the beginning, at the creation. In those six days, he created them male and female. In Mark chapter 14, for in those days there will, uh, will be such tribulations as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Mark 14, 19 and 20. And then again in Luke chapter 11, for example, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation, Luke 11, 50 and 51. From the blood of who? Abel. Genesis chapter 4. 
He believed Abel was a real person. He was not mythologized. The events of creation Jesus trusted in. Now, was Jesus ignorant of what scholars today understand and know to be true and assured of? Or is it possible that the hubris of our modern age has caused us to buy into something that is simply not there? Okay, Uh, we need to to move. Uh, I'm not going to go into a huge... Uh, uh, description of all of these scientific things, and certainly, I, you know, I, I picked out like six or seven of my favorite. I didn't even pick out all I could. Uh, if I did, we'd be here, you know, for at least another week or two. Plus, in, in May, don't forget, we have Eric Lyons coming, and he's going to be dealing with some of these things in a much better way, a much more educated way than I will, uh, because I'm a neophyte at these things. Uh, but anyway, Uh, Some of the things science tells us, things that we know, things that we have discovered. Uh, So in 2011, uh, we we discovered a dinosaur in Canada. I love this one because it had skin, the contents of its stomach. Uh, They broke open the bones and it had soft tissue, blood vessels that were available. So we started cracking open other fossilized dinosaur bones and guess what we found there? More soft tissue. Soft tissue that if they truly died out hundreds of millions of years ago, there should not be any possible way to have soft tissue in those bones and those remains. None. Yet we found cartilage, blood vessels. We can tell you what their last meal was. Based upon the soft tissue. That suggests that maybe the age of the dinosaurs aren't quite as old as we think they are. Uh, One of the most important uh, factors in determining age of living fossils, I'm sorry, fossils that were once alive, I don't mean fossils that are alive now, but fossils that were once alive, is where they're found in the geologic timetable. That's what we refer to it. You know, certain strata down at the bottom, those are older, and then as you move up the different layers or strata, uh, you, you find uh, more and more complex animals. And so down here, you know, the, the, the famous trilobites, you remember the, learning about the trilobites back in, you know, sixth grade science? And uh, that, those are on the bottom because that's the, that's the first truly complex organism was this, was this trilobite. And we found all of these fossil remains of them and so forth. And so, but if you go up another layer or two, then the, the animals become more and more cl- uh, complex uh, you know, they go from asexual reproduction to, uh, to uh, 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 sexual reproduction. And you go further up, and they, they have more organ systems. And further up, and they, it's just more and more and more complex. And so if we find a, a, a specimen, we find it at this layer, we say, well, that, that layer came about during the Cenozoic era or the, uh, you know, whatever era that we want to put it in, the Jurassic period. And that happened 235 million to, to 270 million years ago. And therefore, this animal must be from that time frame. That, that sounds well and good. But uh, uh, part of the problem is that exists nowhere in the world. What we find is that you know, older strata, older layers are somehow on top of newer layers. And it just doesn't make sense unless something catastrophic happened there. Or uh, we find this, this, the, the idea of what we call polystrate fossils. You know, there's, there's a fossil that starts down here in this million year uh, 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 layer and his bones climb all the way up into the next strata. You know, and, and, and one, of the, one of the things that's important to understand about these layers is that they, they, these layers are topped off with a crust of, of stone. They're lithified, we call them. They're lithified. And somehow this animal died, half of it exposed above the lithified layer for millions of years, and yet that part also still fossilized with the rest of it underneath and fossilized. It doesn't make sense. So science tells us that, I mean, this is what we actually find. It's not what the theory tells us we should find. It's what we really find. Or human-dinosaur coexistence. We were... Uh, living in uh, Corsicana, we were about an, an hour, maybe an hour and a half away 
from Glen Rose, Texas, one of the one of the famous dinosaur tracks. And you go there and go to the, the Glen Rose Natural History Museum and everything, and you go out to the riverbed and you see the dinosaurs and, and the dinosaur tracks running through the riverbed, you know, and you know, big, huge tracks. And and then if you look really closely, there's human footprints following the dinosaur. I, I assume following. I, I don't think the, the dinosaur was following the human. <laughs> Could have been, I guess. Maybe it was a chase scene. Uh, but they're also fossilized in the riverbed along with the dinosaur. Cave drawings that eerily look like dinosaurs. Carvings, temples that depict dinosaurs long before dinosaur bones were being discovered, indicating that humans and dinosaurs actually coexisted at a time. Maybe at a time prior to a great catastrophe that happened to the earth. Dating methods, uh, radiometric dating methods, at the very best, are inconsistent. Carbon-14 dating is taking the half-life of carbon-14, which is a little over 5,000 years. So that means if you have two grams of carbon-14 in 5,000 years or 5,370 years or something like that, it decays to nitrogen, uh, and, and, and you know half of it does anyway, and that we call that the half-life. And so if we know how much carbon-14 is there and we can see how much nitrogen is there, then we can say that uh, this much of the of the carbon has turned into nitrogen. In order to get that amount, you have to have, you know, 145,000 years or whatever to accomplish that. And the problem, problem with that is, is uh, we weren't there when the original sample of carbon-14 appeared. Okay, we don't, uh, you know, assuming that every living human and, and plant life existed with the exact same amount of ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, to me is a big assumption. Because the world was different, and we already know that conditions can change the amount of C14 in a sample of C12. We, we know that. Pressure, heat, cold, you know, uh, comets hitting the earth, you know, you know floods happening, to things that, that happen can change the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. But carbon-14 dating relies on a constant ratio throughout the history of the world. When you don't have that, it's difficult to account for all the variables in getting into carbon-14. So uh, carbon dating at best is inconsistent. Uh, the same type of radio, the, the, another radiometric measurement is uranium-238. Again, the same thing. That's, this is on non-living matter. Uranium-238 is a ratio uh, to the normal isotope, which is uranium-235. Uh, so uh, if you have a certain amount of 238 and it decays in, uh, what is it, polonium? I think is what it decays into, but uh, it decays into another element. We have this much uh, versus this much, and therefore this rock is this many years old. And you redo the same test on the same rock sample, and that millions of years old changes. That's what we find. And so we run it many times, and we take our best guess, which generally speaking is what we need. <laughs> That's our best guess. We, we don't need this rock to be 140,000 years old. We need this rock to be, you know, 14 million years old. And so that's, that's kind of our best guess, so it's inconsistent. Uh, the, the human population, uh, at the rate at which humanity reproduces, has been consistent, basically, for as long as we can see. Now, I know we talk about, uh, you know, we have, you know, higher rates of death in the United States and, and uh, you know, lower birth rates, and therefore our population growth is slowing down. Of course, we terrified everyone with the population bomb back in the 70s. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was more serious than the nuclear bomb. We're going to kill ourselves by overpopulating the planet. So uh, a lot of Americans stopped having children. Uh, but in other parts of the world, they didn't stop. They still needed kids to plow the fields and, and you know, make the bread and harvest the wheat and do all those things. And so they needed a large labor force. And, 
uh, the best place to get a large labor force was to have them yourself. And that's what they did. So they, they're still having large families there. So the, the rate of, of human birth has, has remained generally the same. Now, if we back up to how evolution says, well, this is when humans appeared and they started reproducing at that point, and, and we, we, we want to use this exponential growth because obviously, uh, you know, those first few years you're not going to have as many kids as, say, you know, 100 years later when you've got more people having kids. So it's an it's a exponential growth. And so, you know, the parabolic curve, you know, it starts to you know, go up like this. Uh, so we should have somewhere around 10 to the 2,000th power, of, you know, world population. 10 to the 2,000th power. Uh, if the earth uh, truly can only hold about 50 billion people, we would need this earth plus another approximately 210 earths to hold 10 to the 2,000th power number of people. But that's what we would expect if the rate of, of human reproduction uh, were consistent with what we know. Okay, uh, obviously that didn't happen. We don't have, uh, like we don't even have a number that we call 10 to the 2,000th power. So what we have on the earth, we have approximately what, uh, 10 to the 8th power or so, uh, 7.5 billion people. Uh, if we use, extrapolate those, those same numbers backwards, the rates that we could go back, and let's just go to the flood because everything before the flood was destroyed, we're starting over at the flood, about 4,300 years. If you took those rates from 4,300 years ago to the present, we would have somewhere between 6.5 and 8.5 billion people is what we would expect to see. And what we actually see is about 7.5, kind of right in the middle between that 6.5 and 8.5. And this is 7.5 billion. That's what science tells us. It's not what we would expect based upon evolutionary concepts, but it's what science actually has found. Um, one, one more and we'll finish because I know you all ready to eat. Uh, mitochondrial Eve. There's no way, evolutionary science tells us, that uh, we started with just two people. That's impossible. Uh, we started with human beings evolving at different rates in different parts of the world, separated from one another by rivers and lakes and maybe even oceans and seas. And we have this diversity that we have today. But the idea to go back to... A prime couple, Adam and Eve, that's ridiculous. Except for the last 20 years, we've decided, you know, what really is, is there is a mitochondrial Eve. Everyone goes back to a single mother somewhere. We, we can all trace, and, and for lack of a better term, we call her mitochondrial Eve because we are measuring the changes in the mitochondria of the cell. They weren't doing that back, you know, in Jesus' day because they didn't even talk about the mitochondria of the cell back then. They weren't looking at them. Uh, they weren't talking about this back in Darwin's day. You know, the, the DNA was only discovered in the 1950s by, uh, you know, Francis Crick and uh, what's the other, Watson, Watson and Crick model of the DNA molecules. I mean, this, these things are fairly recent discoveries and we're looking at the evidence now, and we're saying, well, science tells us there was a single mother somewhere from which all of humanity is descended. Now, evolutionary theory didn't tell us that. Science tells us that. And what's amazing is that, that all of these anomalous clues of creation, they continue to upset the evolutionary apple cart. Time and again, the supposed geologic timetable is not found anywhere. The supposed time to create oil and fossils and diamonds and, and canyons. You know, that's, that's why diamonds are so expensive. They take millions of years to create. And we can create them in a lab. We call it cubic zirconia so people don't get confused. But I think a lot of people are still confused about what's what. Oil. 
Oil is not a renewable resource that takes millions of years in the ground of the overburden of the soil as it's crushing down and compacting the living material that was left and, and making this black crude sludge that's oil. Millions of years. And yet, we find in different circumstances and environments, oil can made in a fraction, be made in a fraction of the time, a hundred, two hundred, or maybe a thousand years. Maybe that's not quite as renewable as bamboo, but listen, that's still pretty renewable. Fossils being created in, you know, just within the last hundred years or so. Canyons. Oh, can you know how long it takes a creek to create a canyon? That's millions and millions and millions of years except for the canyons up near Mount St. Helens that were created since the 1980s and the eruption of Mount St. Helens. You see, catastrophic events like earthquakes and volcanoes, and dare I say it, a global flood, can change the look of an earth. An earth, by the way, that was created mature. Adam was not an infant when God created him and took a, a rib out of his side and created an infant Eve and then had to wait until they grew with no one taking care of them to an age appropriate for reproduction. God created Adam as a man ready to reproduce and Eve as a woman ready to reproduce. They were mature. The trees God created ready to reproduce. Fruit after its kind. Yielding seeds after its kind. If God created the trees to look old and Adam to look old, couldn't he have created the rock to look old? Couldn't he have created the light of the star having already reached here that would normally take a million years to get here? Couldn't he have created the star with the light already here? Science discoveries continue to confirm the biblical model and confound the evolutionary scientists. Read interviews about people who are looking at the soft tissue of the dinosaurs. They're not saying that ain't real. They're saying, we ain't got a clue. It shouldn't be this way. But we know one thing. It can't be that the Bible's right. What prejudices will we start with? Conflicting scientific data upsets the evolutionary models that threatens the theory to its very core. But God created this mature earth, one that appeared old and was ready to reproduce. All of this supports the biblical data, which suggests, call me crazy, that the earth is somewhere between 6,000 to 10,000 years old. Somewhere in that time frame. Can't pin, pinpoint everything down to the to the, the, the moment, uh, I know there's a, uh, there was a, some guy years ago uh, came up with uh, 4004 AM. You think, what's AM? Well, that's that's you know, like Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. AM uh, was uh, uh, Anno Mundi, I believe is what it was, and it was the year of creation was 4004 uh, BC, which, you know, I guess, uh, but he would go back. So the year 1 a.m. was equal to 4004 B.C. Uh, I, I think that's a little presumptuous, but uh, he's throwing it out there as about 6,000 years old, which, which is what we see in, in, in everything that science shows us. And so while the scientific community scorns a, a young earth creationism, and it really does, uh, there is no scientific reason to give up the biblical data. They're not to evolutionary theory, not to theistic evolution, not to old earth creationism. And so I would say this in my so what statement. So what? Be confident in what you know. Tonight, if you have a need that the church can help you with, whether it's prayers of the congregation, uh, restoration, or you just want a little strength, or you need to obey the gospel, all things are ready if you'll come while we stand and while we sing.